Okay, we are live. Okay, thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, as we do it every month, and this month we are going to discuss elbow flexion deformity in brachial plexus birth palsy patients. This is a very interesting uh, topic. And uh, we have none other than Dr. Uh, Professor Alain Gilbe, who is uh, considered as worldwide authority in brachial plexus birth policy. Uh, he has been a teacher to many uh, practicing uh, brachial plexus surgeons. And uh, he is stationed at Paris and Barcelona at the moment. We know uh, and we read frequently his textbook of brachial plexus injury, and this is the I recommend to uh, to all my fellows to read this book, and this is there in my library. You all will be uh, overwhelmed to learn that Professor Gilbe has published more than 165 research papers in the literature. And I was seeing that uh, he has about 3,800 citations. So any new paper on brachial plexus birth policy has cited uh, Professor Gilbey's paper. So I have been fortunate to spend some time with him uh, in meetings and learn from him the uh, intricacies of uh, plexus um, policy management. And uh, today in Journal Club, we have... Uh, four interesting papers, which will be read by Orthopid Fellows and Dr. Gilbe and many other colleagues are here to, uh, to comment and question those papers and review those papers. And at the end, Dr. Gilbe will uh, take us through his approach of this patients. So without uh, wasting time, I will invite uh, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Gaurav. Dr. Gaurav Gupta is a consultant uh, pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, at New Delhi. And uh, Gaurav, Gaurav, please share your uh, presentation. Meanwhile, if you have any question or comment regarding the paper, you can share in a chat box and we will take those questions for you. So, hello, Ellen Jilbe, sir. And hello everyone. Uh, I hope my voice is audible to all and screen is visible to all. Yeah, be be a little louder, Gaurav. It's it's visible. Okay. So uh, so I'm presenting this paper, which is titled as "What Influences Contracture Formation in Lower Motor Neuron Disorders: Severity of Denervation or Residual Muscle Function." An analysis of elbow contracture in hundred children with unilateral brachial plexus birth injury. This was published in Journal of Children's Orthopedics 2018 from Department of Orthopedics and Neurosurgery, VU University Medical Center, Amsterdam. It's an original article with level two evidence and it's a prognostic study. So as the title suggests, this paper is based on the age old question that what is the primary cause of contracture formation in brachial plexus birth injury? And it is related to law of Delpec and law of Guerin, where law of Delpec primarily supports that the cause of contracture is muscle imbalance, whereas law of Guerin suggests that the primary reason for contracture formation is denervation or lesion of the nervous system. So with denervation, leads to reduced muscle growth or hypertrophy, which further causes contracture formation. Whereas in case of muscle imbalance, if the agonist is weak, the antagonist is not stressed and thus leads to inhibition of normal growth and contracture formation. For example, in cases of elbow, if the triceps is weak, biceps is not stressed, leading to inhibition of its growth and contracture formation. So the purpose of this study is to test which factor is more related to flexion contracture formation of elbow in children with brachial plexus birth injury, whether it is the extent of denervation or the residual muscle imbalance. It included 100 children with unilateral brachial plexus birth injury. Out of them, 61 were boys. Mean age was 10.4 years with a range of 4 to 18 years. 
right arm was involved in 60 kids 58 kids underwent surgical plexus reconstruction in infancy children with complete lesions that is naraka score and children who were non cooperative with muscle testing were excluded from the study so denervation and extent of neural lesion was classified according to naraka's classification upper arm muscle peak force was measured with microfet 2 dynamometer in both the affected and the unaffected side degree of elbow flexion contracture was measured with a goniometer the influences of combined effect of various parameters on contracture were assessed in a multivariate model where the dependent parameter was flexion contracture and independent parameters included prior neurosurgery extent of neurology age of the child paresis of flexors and extensors which was calculated as percentage of force of the unaffected side and ratio between the flexor and extensor force it had underwent a thorough statistical analysis where all these tests were used most important being the univariate and multivariate analysis so there were 57 kids with narakas 1 injury 13 with narakas 2 and 30 with narakas 3 the mean flexion contracture was 25 degrees with a range of 90 degrees to minus 5 degrees. Both extensors and flexors were weaker and flexors were more affected than the extensors. Contractures were more severe in Narakas 2 and 3 as compared to Narakas 1. Flexion contractures were more severe in operated children and flexion contractures were related to the age of the child. As we can see in this table, Flexion force was more severely affected as compared to the extension force and thus the ratio of affected versus unaffected was more severe in flexion force. Also flexion contractures were related to severity of extensor paresis. Flexion contractures were related to relative dominance of flexors only in the operated children. Multivariate analysis showed that age, prior neurosurgery and paresis of extensors were independent factors influencing the contractures, whereas Naraka's class paresis of flexors and ratio of flexor extensor force were not significant in the multivariate model as they were in the univariate model. Also, we can see in this table that as the Naraka's class increased, the severity of elbow contracture, elbow flexion contracture increased and kids who underwent neurosurgery had more severe elbow flexion contracture. So to discuss, this study showed that elbow flexion contractures in brachial plexus birth injury are related to denervation, severity of extensor paresis and the age of the child. Disturbed muscle balance is not a factor it is only significant for operated children and it is negative in multivariate model. This study also found more contractures in children with more severe brachial plexus birth injury. Growth impairment is a factor is supported by the finding that contractures were related to age. So this study confirms previous longitudinal and cross-sectional studies which found no effect of imbalance in infancy on contracture formation. And muscle imbalance may play a secondary role in causation of these contractures as described in earlier studies also. So this study does not completely negate the role of muscle imbalance. Limitations, Naraka's class and neurosurgery are imprecise measures for denervation. This study is unable to identify the role of neurosurgery in outcome of elbow contracture. And measured elbow flexion is influenced by shoulder muscles. Chosen force measurement method results in systematic error. The confounding by this systematic error affects the force, paresis and balance values. This is a cross-sectional study and muscle balance at infancy might be more important for contracture formation, which is not analyzed in this study. So to conclude, this study suggests that brachial plexus birth injury contracture formation is predominantly related to denervation and muscle imbalance is not a dominant factor. Thank you. And this paper is open for discussion. So uh, 
Gaurav very nicely read this complex and extensive paper. And uh, we have been hearing that muscle imbalance is not the only cause and there are very, the failure of elongation of denervated muscle can lead to contracture. So, um, Dr. Jilbe, I like to uh, please give your opinion and uh, questions about this paper. What, what do you think, uh, how is this paper constructed? Well, um, it shows the difficulty to analyze the, the contracture. Uh, because you will see uh, four papers and you'll see different interpretations. And so uh, it is extremely superficial to say it has nothing to do with imbalance, for instance, because we know for sure that paralysis of triceps uh, aggravates the, 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 the contracture. So what is the real reason for contracture, and that is a big problem. And um, up to now, we don't know. I think the most interesting work uh, which has been done now is done by uh, uh, Cornwall. Roger the, Cornwall. Roger Cornwall. He, because he studied really the muscle itself to show the, the, the uh, anomalies in the, in the muscle after denervation and uh, uh, showing that there, is, uh, there are disturbances of the contractility of the muscle. And he now proposes a treatment, medical treatment, yeah. for this to probably avoid it. I don't know if it is working or not, but I like the idea. I don't like too much the mechanistic uh, type of uh, explanation, you know? It does this because there is that, you know? And, uh, we all know there is multi-factors and uh, uh, especially, for instance, with the shoulder. The shoulder is very important and we will see that later. Um, so um, I'm not too convinced by that paper. <laughs> so I, I have yeah, a few conclusions. Yeah. So I have a few questions. The first is the incidence of contracture is seen less in Narakas 1. Now we know that elbow flexor is supplied, is uh, the elbow flexor supplied by C56. So we see in Narakas 1 more affection. So why the incidence should go low if that's the etiology? That, that should have similar effect. You, you know? see that the authors have uh, eliminated the complete paralysis. Yes, type 4. So why? We don't, we don't know why. Why did they eliminate the complete paralysis? And uh, uh, because uh, in fact, uh, elbow contracture is more frequent in upper paralysis than in complete paralysis. Right. And uh, uh, as it is com more difficult to explain, they probably prefer to, to take it out from the, the study, but because, uh, if you have a complete paralysis, you usually have uh, paralysis of triceps also. And uh, that it is true that there are less contractures in complete paralysis. Um, so really, uh, really honestly, uh, I think the two points are, why do we have a, uh, a, contract uh, a contracted uh, elbow? And the second thing is, uh, how do we treat it? Yes, but in the middle, in the in the you know in the midway, uh, if it's more at its age, more at this, more at that, it doesn't read too much for the understanding of the of the problem. Yeah. Another uh, thing is we have seen a few children with elbow extension contracture in the first week of life, and we are not able to flex the elbow completely like a normal side. Now the question is, and I see that they have a deep posterior elbow crease, which gradually improves as the bicep strength comes. So we see contractures right at birth, and then there is not still denervation. So how does the, are those intrauterine denervations? Because if we 
consider denervation leads to failure of elongation that should happen after a certain period of time and why we we see contractures at birth in few children uh, you must you must be very careful because uh, uh, we know two things one in the, the vast majority like 99.99% of cases uh, denervation will occur and especially contracture can occur only after birth after birth yeah it's impossible that it occurs at, at birth unless there are cases we know which are not obstetrical paralysis yeah or which are um, nerve lesions isolated nerve lesions which can be uh, which are different problems so yeah. you should not mix them all you know and uh, uh, we all have seen uh, one case or two cases which are funny, we don't understand, but we should not make rules with uh, yeah. very few cases. In, in general, you know, then the, the paralysis cannot be seen uh, before three weeks after birth. You, you see absence of movement, but you cannot detect it with EMG, for instance. Right. So uh, if you have something before, then you, 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 you go into something different, which is uh, one of the big ideas of the, of the obstetricians. It is right. that the obstetrical paralysis is not due to birth, but it, it may be something pre-birth. Existing. Exactly. And that, they, uh, that is something they use a lot uh, when they go to, to, when they have lawsuits and things like this. So, we, we should not go into yes. this, which is not our problem as surgeons. Yeah, right. Another question from uh, Dr. Nishal Nayak, who is involved in a lot of adult plexus surgeries as well. And he says that if degeneration, denervation leads to failure of elongation, then adult patients should also have contractures, but we don't see them as a routine. So what is the, uh, why there is difference? You're right. You're right. It's not denervation that leads to contracture. It's denervation in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in special cases, in special uh, uh, surroundings. And uh, only in small babies, because if you have a denervation, in, for instance, in an adult, you will not have this contracture. And that is where the work of Cornwall shows that the muscle fibers, if they are denervated very young, they can transform into something different that, con that, that gets this contraction. So uh, you cannot say paralysis leads to contraction. Right. Fine, so that, that's a nice paper, but as Gaurav, the lot of limitations you have mentioned, still the things are unclear that Pure denervation leads to failure of elongation. So let's uh, go on. Move. Yes, got a question. Yeah. So I just wanted to answer that uh, question by Jibbe sir. That why they excluded. So they have mentioned that they excluded uh, complete lesions because of extreme weakness of the upper arm muscles, precluding force measurement. So they could not measure the force. Uh, uh, in those patients where a lot of weakness. So that, that is the reason why they excluded this. Yeah. But still we see in uh, palm plexopathy patients, a lot of patients with elbow flexion contracture as well. So that's fine. Fine. Let's, let's move on to the second paper. Uh, Charlene. Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to speak discuss this paper, the prevalence, rate of progression and treatment of elbow flexion contracture in children with brachial plexus birth palsy. It's a paper published in JPO in 2012, was uh, published by Lindsay Scheffler and uh, colleagues and was from Shriners Hospital, California. It's a level four therapeutic study. So they start with this introduction that uh, in 2012, when they published this paper, the prevalence, the risk factors and the rate of progression of elbow flexion contractures in obstetric brachial plexi, plexus palsy had not been established. And the literature at that time varied the prevalence of uh, elbow flexion contractures 
right from 4.6% to as high as 89.5%. And the effectiveness of non-operative treatment in these elbow flexion contractures had not yet been studied. So they took two arms for this paper. The first, they tried to study the demographics, the prevalence and rate of progression of elbow flexion contractures. In the second arm, they have tried to study the effectiveness of non-operative treatment in the long run. So it's a retrospective study of 319 patients over a long period from 92 to 2009, over a period of 17 years. And they defined uh, elbow flexion contractures as any flexion, fixed flexion deformity of the elbow more than 10 degrees. So total, in all, they had 319 patients and they divided these patients into two groups. One, according to the Narakas, according to the nerve root involvements. And uh, second, according to the age group, so as to study the effect of elbow flexion contractures according to the age and whether the prevalence increases as the age increases and does uh, a non-operative treatment uh, do well in adolescents also. And they use the following biostatistical methods, the chi-square test for Narakas and age groups, the Kaplan-Meier uh, protocol for sex and age distribution and spaghetti plots for magnitude of contractures over period time period. And in the treatment arm, they treated less than 30 degree of flexion contractures with nine times splinting with maximum possible extension. And more than 30 degrees of flexion contractures were treated with serious serial casting until a 30 degree of flexion contractures were, was achieved. After that, they shifted to splinting. So in results, for the demographic part, they found that the prevalence in their study was 48%, which is 152 of 319 patients in their study had FFD of elbow more than 10 degrees. 39 patients already had contractures at the first visit with a mean age of 10.8 years. However, we do not know at what age this contracture developed. So in the 113 patients who they had followed from initially, where they did not have elbow flexion contracture, and then went on to develop, the mean age of development of elbow flexion contracture was 5.2 years, with a range of two and a half months to as high as 14.8 years. The median maximum contracture in their study was 20 degrees. And uh, along with that, 32% uh, children had other joint uh, contractures, right from shoulder contractures to forearm contractures, along with radial head dislocations also. So in further in results, they found that 152 patients from 319 had associated elbow flexion contractures and their distribution according to the Narakas was 44%, 32%, and 24% respectively. And according to the age distribution, uh, the 152 patients had the following age distribution, 8% in the early age group, 48% in the middle 4 to 11 age group, and in adolescents, they had 44% uh, prevalence. And they applied the statistics to this group and they found that the difference between the three Narakas surprisingly was not significant. However, the difference of prevalence according to the age group was significant between these groups. Next, they tried to study the treatment part. So in treatment part, in the, uh, in the children who, before they started the treatment, they found that the mean uh, elbow flexion contractures before the splinting was roughly 28 degrees and before casting was 49 degrees. And after casting and splinting, the splinting arm, the elbow flexion contracture remained same, nearly same at 24 degrees. And after casting, it uh, changed to 30 degrees, which is because the end point of casting was 30 degrees. It is surprising that in their study, they found that progression of elbow flexion contractures was 0.1% per year for patients who never received treatment and 4.4% per year for patients who later received some form of treatment. However, there is a selection bias for this group also because those who did not develop contracture did not need any treatment. So these are the limitations of the study which I found. The prevalence, they say, as high as 48%, but this is of the patients who visited the hospital and not in the population itself. The study does not consider range of movement, but just the elbow flexion contracture, which is a more range of movement would be a more functional assessment. The treatment follow-up for the uh, treatment part of their study was inadequate because they had some patients who had follow-up of zero. So they only had one casting or splinting record. And after that, they did not have follow-up for that part. So instead, they should have had a 
a minimum follow up for the treatment arm of the study so as to get us a better idea and to take out the uh, extremes from the uh, from the curve and uh, they did mention that 68% a very high percentage of these patients had some form of surgery either a nerve surgery or a soft tissue surgery but its effect on the elbow flexion contracture was not considered as some of these patients might have an early flexion deformity because of the cast or spica they are put in and these might resolve early after uh, after physiotherapy and nine children which is 6% in this study had radial head dislocations and uh, they did not treat the, these subgroup differently from others no surgical intervention was considered for them and lastly technique of casting was not focused in this subgroup so in application uh, from this paper we get the idea about the prevalence to expect and to guide us that a high prevalence of this elbow flexion contracture can be expected in patients with obpp as well as we can expect this uh, prevalence to occur in all the narakas type not only in narakas 2 or 3 where we expect ffd to develop because of elbow extension weakness and uh, this study gives us a nice idea of non operative treatment its results the expected results which is good that about 10 degree of improvement after each serial cast and uh, maintenance of the uh, 30 degree of uh, contractures with splint with night time splint so that's all so i think you have muted sir molin sir i think you have muted so nicely read paper shalin uh, thank you and uh, dr jilbe how would you rate this paper and what are the shortcomings of that well it is um, it is interesting because we we start to have some information uh, as you can see information is very limited because when when we want to come to know the prevalence you understand that in the literature there is a lot of variations uh, i have seen one of the slide showing between 4% and something like 80%, 80. and uh, so it's uh, yes 4 to 89 so uh, there is a problem because uh, uh, that means there is a problem in the way the people examine in uh, uh, the fact that many patients probably will not consult or i don't know but there is something here that we don't understand it cannot be uh, such a difference that is one thing uh, the second thing uh, i found interesting is uh, uh, is uh, is in fact uh, it confirms what i told you that in the complete paralysis you have less contractures than in the the upper especially the uh, c5 c6 uh, type of uh, a uh, patient which uh, i will explain later why uh, then uh, it's also interesting because it 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 starts to 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 speak about uh, age also because age is a absolutely major factor and uh, uh, this is not very well explained when you see for instance that uh, i suppose that that means uh, that in the in the patients 84 were discovered after 11 years but i cannot believe that it means 84 patients had onset after 11 years because it never happened in my life that i have seen a patient who at 11 had no contracture and start to have a contracture after so that means the patient came late yeah they have they have said also that they have uh, quite a lot of late so that doesn't mean much but it is very important because um for prognosis when you have a patient to who comes to see you is a 4 year old and has a contracture does that mean it's a very severe contracture that you will go up, go to a very severe contracture or was it has nothing to do as another patient will come at 7 or 8 and it would and they will have the same prognosis this is something we don't really know very well but age that is something that we should address seeing the natural history 
of the contracture according to the age of onset. But then you have to see the patient from the beginning. You cannot start to see them when they are 11. Right. That is one thing. Then we will talk after maybe uh, it's a very interesting day, the, uh, the splinting and uh, the treatment of uh, splinting and casting. Uh, the, it's very interesting when you look at the, the results. I mean, splinting gives absolutely zero. If you see the difference, there is absolutely no improvement. And that, I agree with that. Splinting, we will talk about that, never treats the contracture. It, it just avoids the contracture to become- Progress. To, to progress, exactly. Uh, but then casting is, can be very efficient also, but it misses something, which is the long-term because you see a result after casting, but what happened five years later, because many of these patients will recur. So that is missing also. Yeah. There are two uh, questions from delegates and one is very important that, is there any relationship between flexion deformity and the rotational deformity of humerus? What we have seen in our practice is some patients who have coexisting elbow, I mean, shoulder yeah. internal rotation contracture, they are more concerned. I will just say yes. And I will, <laughs> I will explain that after in my talk. But yeah. of course, there is a relation. So none of this paper is discussing how many of patients have associated shoulder internal rotation contracture because that makes the elbow flexion deformity more cosmetically alarming rather than functional, uh, you know, so they well, have not mentioned that. I, I think the, the contracture in the, in the elbow and the contracture in the shoulder are from the same origin. Yeah. So maybe treating one would treat both. So we'll right. talk about that later. Okay. That's a so, good question. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Thanks, Charlene. That was a wonderful paper. And I would invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Meet. And he is presenting the continuation of this paper, which the same institute has uh, done. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll be presenting a paper titled uh, Bicep Brachii Long Head Overactivity Associated with Elbow Flexion Contracture in Brachial Plexus Birth Injury. This was published in the year 2012 in the Journal of uh, bone and joint uh, surgery by and was tie, uh, authored by Lindsay Scheffler et al. And uh, the investigations were performed at Shriners Hospital, uh, Sacramento, California. So as we have seen in the previous study by the same authors, out of 319 patients, 48% developed an elbow contracture of more than 10 degrees with more than one third patients having a contracture of more than 30 degrees. When we have a look at the etiology of elbow fixed flexion deformity in obstetric brachial injury, in 1994, Bollinger and Hofer proposed that elbow flexion returns first and dominates extensor uh, function. In 2007, Sibinski et al. proposed that the muscle imbalance or co-contraction was the etiology for the fixed flexion deformity. In 2011, Niccolo et al. proposed that the impaired growth of the denervated muscles were, were the reason behind the uh, elbow flexion deformity. This paper proposes that the overuse of the long head of biceps as a shoulder flexor and a humeral head stabilizer is the reason for the fixed flexion deformity. The aim of this paper was to compare the mean activity duration of the long and short head of biceps in the affected versus the unaffected limb. The alternate hypothesis that they tested for uh, was that the elbow flexor extends a muscle imbalance uh, and they measured this by uh, measuring the isometric muscle strength. 21 patients with a mean age of 14.2 years, ranging from 6.3 to 18.8 years, were included in the study. Uh, electromyography was performed to record activity of biceps brachii during four upper extremity tasks. Elbow flexion extension, hand to head, high reach, and overhead ball throw. A handheld surface dynamometer 
was used to quantify strength of elbow flexor and extensor muscles in both instances a pet t test was used to compare affected and the unaffected sides the results were divided into two separate categories one was what they uh, received from the electromyography and the second was what they received from the results from the surface dynamometer when we have a look at the uh, electromyography results that they achieved the biceps when the biceps brachii muscle belly and the triceps brachii uh, muscle belly were uh, compared it was found that in the four upper extremity tasks there was no difference in the affected and the unaffected limbs in both of them however when the long head of biceps and the short head of biceps were uh, the the emg was done for them it was found that the hand to head and high high reach both of them having significant abduction activity they were found that it was found that the affected limb had a significantly greater duration of muscle activity in the long head of biceps as and short head of biceps had no such correlation the surface dynamometry revealed that there was no difference observed between the strength of elbow flexion and extension in the affected limb this disproves the hypothesis of muscle imbalance as a cause of elbow fixed flexion deformity in the present study 16 of 19 patients had radiographic evidence of deformity at the glenohumeral joint which supports the proposed hypothesis that the long head of biceps brachii helps to stabilize the weakened and deformed glenohumeral joint the long head of biceps in addition to flexion of the elbow stabilizes the glenohumeral joint so its over activity also flexes the elbow the limitations that i found from this paper was that the paper suggested a, a cadaveric study which had 72% which stated that 72% cases uh, had a common innervation on in the long head of biceps as well as the short head of biceps so if that is so then how do we explain the difference in the duration of activity of both the heads the second that i found was that narakas type and uh, the history of previous neurosurgical treatment was not taken into consideration also the 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 authors recognized the variability of the surface electromyography however uh, they used fine wire emg uh, it was found to be more accurate however they had to restrict themselves to adolescents and older children because of its invasive nature and so the younger uh, age could not be tested thank you so thank you uh, neet that was a wonderful wonderfully narrated paper and uh, the limitations which you have shown they are also alarming so uh, yeah dr jilbe what do you think about this paper the role of biceps brachii long head to produce elbow flexion deformity it's a um, very interesting very, very interesting paper and uh, uh, i think that unfortunately we cannot go in depth into into this because uh, uh, this is a big discussion that we will have probably in november because they are coming uh, also in november uh, because um, the fact that there is a link between the biceps and uh, uh, elbow flexion is sure it's sure but it's not unique because when we speak to treatment the treatment is not with biceps the treatment is with brachialis so that is one thing uh, the second thing is um, my experience which is which is not scientific i have not done the emgs and all this is that it is the short biceps and why do i say that it's because when you have a, a contracture of the short biceps you have a lengthening of the coracoid and lengthening of the coracoid correspond to lack of external rotation so the fact that you have a contracture of the short biceps gives you a problem of rotation in the shoulder and when you treat this if you resect the coracoid in the same time you resect the insertion on the short biceps and my feeling has been that you improve the elbow if it's an if it's done early so this is something very complex and uh, uh, 
I like this paper, to, to the discussion that we can have with this, but it, it is maybe far too uh, complicated to, to discuss just on, on the on elbow contracture. So one point which grabbed my attention is uh, in the shoulder biomechanics, the long head of biceps has been considered as an anterior stabilizer of the shoulder joint. Now the patients with interrotation contracture or C56 palsy, they have posterior instability and not the anterior instability. So biceps role as a stabilizer is doubtful when the stability is not anterior, instability is not anterior, it's posterior, you know? So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's a problem which I see with this paper. So I, I'm glad that uh, we will meet those faculties in November and I'll inquire with them. Because you re remember that the, the long biceps insert on the top of the, of the humeral humeral. head. So that means yeah. if there was a contracture uh, on one side, you have a joint which is very strong, very, you know, and uh, if you resist to it, that means you should have inferior subluxation of the of the uh, of the humeral head, head. Uh, you have sometimes some modifications but not something regularly and not very common so i'm not convinced by the idea that it's the long biceps yeah so. on the contrary we have seen like that's a different subject but we have seen by a long head of biceps getting tight with anterior instability helping in pushing the humeral head in the location and when we put an elbow extension splint, they raise the arm. But earlier their abduction is limited, but the moment oh, we put the arm. That is different. I think that is different. That usually happens in patients who have problems with triceps, especially the long triceps. Yeah, because C7. long triceps is paralyzed, then you have this type of problem. And if you stabilize, you, you may have a much better. So, I mean, yeah. again, you know, I, I don't know, you know, all these, there are plenty of things we don't understand. And I'm not saying I am right or I'm wrong or you are wrong or anything like this. It's just that this is a, a, a fascinating subject to yeah. go in depth. Right. So the same, one of the delegates has asked the same question that why the brachialis muscle is totally ignored in this paper and they have not taken in consideration. So, so they would, they could have tested brachialis also, uh, but we will inquire this question, Dr. Nishal, to the authors when we meet in November. Yeah. So, That's true. Right. So uh, let's let's move on to the last paper by Dr. Sheena Bansal, uh, who is our current fellow, and she is going to talk about the treatment of uh, elbow flexion contracture. And this paper is from a parent institute, Hospital Sick Children by Dr. Howard Clark and team. Yes, Sheenam, please share your, uh, start your presentation. I'm presenting paper uh, titled as Serial Casting and Splinting of Elbow Contractures in Children with Obstetric Brachial Plexus Palsy. This paper was published in Journal of Hand Surgery in 2010, authored by Emily, Trisha Roy, Derek Stephens, Howard Clark. This study was done in Sikits, uh, Canada Hospital by Department of Plastic Surgery. It was an original article, retrospective review of patients, level of evidence four. The purpose of this paper was to evaluate the effectiveness of serial casting and splinting of elbow flexion contractures in children with obstetric brachial plexus palsy. 19 children were included in the study with unilateral brachial plexus palsy. Mean age was 11 years. The patients who were referred for non-surgical treatment to the occupational therapy department. There was no information about the type of brachial plexus palsy. Deformity more than 20 degree was considered for treatment. Contractures 20 to 40 degree underwent serial splinting 
एवरेज डिफॉर्मिटी वॉज थर्टी फाइव डिग्री एंड कॉन्ट्रेक्टर मोर देन फोर्टी डिग्री अंडरवेंट सिलेंड्रिकल कास्टिंग एवरेज डिफॉर्मिटी बींग थ्री डिग्री Firstly, therapeutic heat was applied, and then passive stretching was done. If deformity was twenty to forty degrees, then custom milk thermoplastic elbow extension or thosis was applied, and follow up was done after two weeks. Heat stretching and remolding till was done till the patient reaches a plateau. If the deformity was more than forty degrees, cylindrical cast was applied. It was changed weekly until elbow extension was reached plateau or the deformity was less than thirty degree. Cylindrical cast was applied. Uh, this picture in this picture it has been shown and uh, this splint was given and uh, it was helped uh, with the anterior anteriorly with the Velcro fastener. Nine patients were followed within the one year. And eleven patients were follow between one and four years. Initial best achieved and final outcome elbow extension passive range of motion was noted. In the compliant group, there were nine patients, and in the non-compliant group, there was there were ten patients, making fifty three percent of the total. And number of patients. Who were less than eight years were five, and all were in the non-compliant group. In the compliant group, the initial passive range of motion was forty-four degree, which was eighteen degree at final passive rate at final uh, final follow. In the non-compliant group, initial passive range of motion was fifty-two degrees, and final was thirty-three degrees. It was known. non significant between best best achieve mo, uh, motion and final range of motion was difference was known significant in the compliant group and significant in the non compliant group so uh, which reveals that patient compliance is a significant factor in the success of maintaining treatment gains age at initiation of casting also contribute to the success of treatment non compliant patients had higher deformities and after this study they formulated that assessment education and motivation of the patient and the family matters and if the family or the patient is not motivated they should be re evaluated at an older age before uh, considering them for the uh, cast or splint application limitations of this study was uh, it, there was poor power of the study inadequate follow up was there no data was there for active range of motion at the elbow there was no information about nrakas classification and technique of casting it helped me uh, to uh, that patient uh, before considering conservative treatment for the deformity it requires compliance and motivation from family and patients both thank you so shinam that was nicely read paper and this um says clearly that uh, those patients or families who are non compliant with the splinting the the gain which we have got through the treatment may not last so that's an important but as you mentioned rightly there is very less number of patients so power of study is very low to uh, study these variables i would like to know from dr jilbe how how did you find this paper well i i, I know it of course because i uh, i know very well uh, what clark um it's it's very interesting uh, the only thing that i i would like to know better is when you speak about uh non compliant uh is it for casting or splinting because it's not at all the same uh, yes. a patient with which who has a cast uh cannot be non compliant if the cast right. is well done but splinting is very common because that mean so uh, uh you see uh, 
it's difficult to, to, to see here what, what it corresponds. It may be, for instance, that all the patients with, with uh, splinting were non-compliant, which I would understand, because if you try to, to correct a contracture with a splint, the patient has pain. And if the patient has pain, he will take the, the, the splint out. That's why uh, my idea is that you should never try to treat a contracture with a splint. Either you use a, a cast, which works very well. In my hands, it's almost 100% good results. Very good. Uh, and then you use the splint afterwards to maintain. To maintain. Either you, you go to surgery. And then you use the splint after to maintain. So in my, my opinion is that splinting is not a treatment for elbow contracture. It's an adjuvant. You know, you can only use it before, after, whatever you want, but not for the treatment. Right. So th that's a lovely inference. And we have a few questions about your approach, but we would like to ask those once you... Uh, take us through your approach to uh, elbow flexion deformity. And uh, so you can share your screen and start your talk. And uh, all the delegates would like to pause their questions and learn about how would you deal with uh, elbow flexion deformity in your patients. Okay. So thanks, Srinam. That was nicely read paper. Thank you, sir. Do you see? Is that okay? Uh, not yet. You can try. Uh, you can share your screen from bottom. No. Ah, it says error. was working on the other, the other yeah one. so you you may uh, stop sharing and share it again yeah but i don't have it anymore it says error uh, okay uh -huh. yes now we can see your slide yeah now you can see it yes yes okay perfect great So all the delegates, uh, you can post your questions in chat box and at the end of this talk, we will we'll take them one by one. Okay, so um, we'll talk. And for, first, you know, uh, it's a bit about uh, prevalent, you know, and uh, uh, it's, uh, there are many papers in the, in the literature and uh, uh, this was a paper with uh, Mark uh, Hoffer. Um, and you see that in this, in this, in this series, it's uh, almost 85% uh, uh, or 90% of the patient who had contracture. If you start looking at a small contracture, you will find that almost every patient has a, uh, a contracture. And you remember that there are two problems. One is, of course, the cosmetic problem. And it's important to see that there are two problems because um, some patients would come only for cosmetic reasons. Others will come because they have functional problems. So that was uh, um, Moray who divided a significant contracture in uh, less than 30 degrees and more than 30 degrees. And in fact, uh, this is probably what we use best. Now, uh, this was the, the, the paper you had, uh, you already, uh, uh, shown and the, the conclusion is that uh, in my conclusion is that sprinting is effective to stop the progression but not to treat the contraction. Now, why? And there are many papers about on, on this uh, subject. Especially uh, Rod Hentz uh, did a, a big study on this of different 
all the different possibilities between uh, um, intra uh, intrauterine uh, contractures, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the balance between uh, triceps and biceps, between uh, uh, compartment syndrome. So some people say it's a compartment syndrome of the of the biceps. And uh, so um, there are many, many uh, uh, ideas. And uh, uh, of course, uh, one of the most uh, uh, well accepted uh, is that the renovation uh, does not work as well as in normal renovation in adult. And then you have uh, uh, co-contractions uh, with the antagonist. Uh, uh, in fact, as I told you, uh, uh, from the operations I did uh, is that uh, I find that there is uh, many, in many of these children an association of lack of external rotation and contracture of the elbow. And many of these children, if you start looking at the coracoid, you find a long coracoid because I remind you that the, uh, the short biceps inserts here on the tip of the coracoid. And here is the pectoralis. And uh, so when you resect the, the coracoid, you, in the same time, desinsert the uh, short biceps. This is uh, an hypothesis. And uh, up to now, uh, we have not been able to, to prove it. Now, uh, the treatments I use, one of them is a serial uh, Casting and it's a very, it's a very old. Uh, you see, the study it was done uh, 20, uh, ten years ago, um, and uh, this is you've seen it. It's the same same type of uh, treatment as you've seen uh, with uh, Howard Clark. Three consecutive casts, usually separated by three weeks, and then the night splint. But if it's a if it's a moderate, if you have a 30 degrees, even sometimes two will be enough. Or, uh, and what is very important is how you to do you, the, 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 the cast. Because if you don't do the cast well, you may have no result. So you don't say uh, the results of the, of, of the cast versus the result of something else. It's the result of your cast because you have to do it in slight traction of the elbow. You need to be two people. One of them is, is, is uh, extending the elbow with traction, not too much. If you do too much, the patient will have pain at night and he will come the next day to take out the cast. So it's uh, really uh, uh, the balance there. The balance is between uh, how tight you do the cast or not. Okay, this is the type of a result, result you get. Now, uh, in this uh, series, this is what I got uh, for results. Um, you see that the cast is good, but not perfect. And uh, it will improve the extension. It will not give a zero lack of extension, which you get sometimes with surgery. But with cast, you don't. You improve it. This is the duration of the treatment, see about 50 days. Um, now, when we compare the final result with the type of paralysis, you see that when you have uh, triceps, Paralysis, and no triceps paralysis. You, that makes big differences. So it's it's also important when you make when you have a complete paralysis, the results are much better. Now, here we are. The final results. So. We will come later to the indications, but just keep in mind that 
the serial casting, the ideal time is nine, 10, you know, from eight to 11 years old. These are the, in the, the best timing. And then afterwards you need, of course, night splinting. The contracture can progress until the age of 15. That means until the age of 15, you cannot speak of a result. And that's a big problem with the, the papers that are published is they see, show you uh, results after one year, two years, but they don't show you results at, at 15 years old. This is uh, uh, the literature, but there are very few uh, 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 no, this is surgery. Yeah, yeah, in surgery. This is the second thing. Surgery, and you can see everything has been published, very little, extremely little. When you see, for, for instance, the paper in the, by Stance, 37 cases, but out of these, only, see, only three were obstetrical paralysis. So, and it's completely different. If you talk about post-traumatic contracture, and if you talk about obstetrical paralysis, you're not talking about the same thing. So, in the literature, you don't find a good series of, of surgical release. Um, this, is, this was an, quite also an old series from 10 years ago. And uh, uh, I did, in fact, two uh, different approaches. One, I started uh, before 2002 with an anterior approach. And then uh, you will see, well, all this statistical, not so important. The anterior approach, you see, big problem was lengthening of the biceps. When you do the, the anterior release at one time, you find the biceps tight. So you really feel you should do the lengthening of the biceps because otherwise you cannot have a complete extension. And uh, I did it, you see? And this is what you get, complete extension. But one of the patients lost complete flexion of the elbow. So I decided to stop this method. I had to do a Steindler. I had to do secondary surgery to recover elbow flexion. So this was really terrible. And uh, you see, this is, these are the results beside the uh, this complication, they do uh, quite well and they get, of course, good results, especially if you don't have a biceps, you know, it's uh, not a big problem. So I went, I switched to the lateral approach. And uh, that's what I've been doing now since uh, uh, 20 years. And uh, uh, this was on 70 cases. I've done more than 250 now. And you see, I do a lateral incision, uh, desinsertion, of brachioradialis, then anterior capsulotomy. I cut the, the posterior fibers of the brachialis, not completely the brachialis, but the posterior uh, part of the brachialis. And I do partial disinsertion of lateral ligament. You need to do that, otherwise you will not get Central, but you don't want to disinsert completely the lateral ligament. So you have to really do a, a small uh, uh, incision. Now, splint for three weeks and then night splinting afterwards. This was a review of uh, 60 patients. See, this is the typical good result that you get. And you see that the result keep uh, uh, mobility keeps uh, good, even, of course, there is a loss after 
the operation that uh, the, at the last uh, follow-up uh, is here at 26 months. Uh, it was uh, okay. Extension, you see that intraoperatively uh, average was minus 15. Uh, a, a few years later, it was only 26. Flexion is good. If, if you say that you lose four degrees, it's almost impossible to see any difference. And the range of motion, of course, uh, is improved, but not as good as uh, intraoperatively. So when we looked at to correlate between the patients, we find that the age of patient at the time of surgery, no correlation. The level of paralysis, no correlation. Duration of the contracture, no correlation. And the post-operative extension loss, no correlation. So what, in my uh, experience, the, the loss, post-operative loss after a few years is 15 degrees. Uh, in the stance, it was 50 to 28 degrees for another indication. So these are the conclusions, you see. Serial casting, we'll speak about that. Serial casting should be used up 12 years old, but it can still use later, we'll, speak, we'll say that. And after 12, 13 years, surgical release is the preferred if, of course, it's a severe contracture. That means over 30 degrees and supplemented always by night splinting. So if we can summar, summarize the results, the indications, you see that some, you have sometimes early contracture in patients which are three, four years old. In these cases, you don't touch the elbow, only night splinting. The idea is if you have a patient of five-year-old who has 30 degrees contracture, what you want is bring him to eight, nine years without aggravating the contracture. So splinting is just to maintain. You're not going to treat it. Between eight years and 11 years, this is the ideal time for casting. So if you do the casting, the three cast, there is almost, as I told you, almost 100% of good results, maybe not perfect, but good results. And uh, then you need a night splinting. So this is excellent treatment, the cast. Sometimes the patient is 11, 12, either is not being treated, either he has been treated and it is a recurrence. In those cases, if it's a, a small contracture, then you can do another cast. Second, you can do two or three times the casting and it is possible. And you can still do it even a patient which is three, four, four, 14, 15 years. And if the patient is over, I would say, I say 45 degrees, because that's, uh, when I say 45 degrees, that it's not me who decided, it's the patient. Because if you try, for instance, to do a cast in a patient who is 60 or 70 degrees, you have absolutely no chance of improving him. So uh, if the patient decides he wants to be treated, then it's, a, it's an operation. And after this operation, you, he needs to wear, to wear a splint until age of 15, probably. And I put a... a uh, aside, I have seen some cases which are adults and have a contracture, and these are very difficult to treat. Uh, I've done a few of those. I did them in two stages. First stage was to do surgery, release. And if you have, for instance, uh, 70 degrees, you will bring the patient to maybe 40. And then after maybe one month or two months after the, the surgery, you will do the casts 
serial casting and you can bring him to 15, 20 degrees. And so you can even treat adults. Thank you. And I just wanted to, to show you, we talked about the uh, November meeting. This is, this is going to be on the, on the palliative surgery. And uh, uh, just to let you know that next year, the, the meeting will be on the repair of lumbosacral plexus. I'm sure you have a good experience in lumbosacral plexus and uh, treatment on uh, so um, uh, if you are uh, interested we will welcome you thank you so thank you very much uh, professor jilbe that was a wonderful talk and summary of uh, what has been your approach we have uh, many questions and let me take them one by one um, the first one is uh, from See, so, so Atul is uh, uh, the Dr. Bharat Kadari from Bangalore. He is asking, uh, what is your experience? What is the incidence of congenital elbow dislocation with uh, elbow elbow or flexion or radial head. Elbow dislocation elbow or, radial head or radial head? Radial head dislocation, probably. That's what we mean. mean. Huh. Well, this is a, uh, this is a, a different subject, but uh, it comes from the same uh, problem because uh, uh, radial head dislocation is a contracture of the tendon of the biceps. If the biceps um, pulls too hard, uh, it starts by putting in, in supination and then it ends up with the, the radial head uh, uh, out. And then uh, the question is, should you put it back or not? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm, you can treat, of course, the the supination, but for the radial head, for the the radial head, if you put back the uh, the uh, radial head into at its, on its normal place, it will it will come out always. So you have to do, to detach the radial head, the, the biceps to the, from the radial head. You can put back the radial head and then you suture the biceps to the insertion of the brachialis, for instance. Right. So there are some papers which showing good result after inserting biceps to the ulna. Yeah, it's, the yeah, 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 it's the same. Uh, it, the problem is only by uh, length, because if you have a contracture, the tendon of the biceps is too short to go yeah. to the ulna. Uh, normal biceps can go to the ulna when you right. have a rupture, for instance, but uh, a shortened biceps, you would need to go to, to, you could, to, go to the uh, brachialis. So you can choose whatever you want. The next question is, what uh, led you to change from your anterior to the lateral approach? Uh, you wanted to avoid biceps long head? It's just that, you know, the, the, the only interest of, of uh, the anterior approach was approaching the, bi the, the tendon of the biceps. And uh, once I decided never to touch the biceps anymore, then <laughs> I could go laterally because uh, the scar is better, because uh, you get a better approach to the joint itself, you know, because you have to cut the... the, the uh, the capsule and the, the ligament, lateral ligament and everything that's very difficult if you do anterior approach. So in, in one of your uh, slides, a patient where you have casting done, so you have applied it in pronation. Ah. So you applied it in pronation every time? You mean the, the, the plaster? Yeah. Or you place in supination? Well, it depends on the, on the tightness. Because, of course, if the biceps is very tight, uh, it is better to put it in supination and uh, uh, to keep it extended. But if it is not too tight, it is, it, it is protecting the radial head to put it in pronation. If you put it in supination and you, you put it very tight, uh, then you may have a dislocation, anterior dislocation. Right. That, that's right. So that's, that's why you chose to put it in pronation. Another question uh, is from Dr. Bharat again. 
uh, how to prevent radial head dislocation secondary to elbow flexion pronation contracture can we prevent it secondary to what elbow flexion contracture and pronation contracture in some people no, no, it's in supination and in supination fact, yeah it's in supination that you have a dislocation yeah usually because uh, the, the first step of uh, of the dislocation of the radial head is the supination yeah because if you have a pronation and if you tighten the biceps then you become you come in in supination first right so prevent the, the only way to prevent it and i don't know is to for instance if you have a, a supination is to treat the supination with a, a zancoli procedure if you lengthen the biceps then you have much less risk of dislocation right so that that's what i also would do now the other question is how frequently you need to resect coracoid process in your uh -huh. internal rotation contractures In fact, you don't need to. Uh, you know that there are two ways of treating uh, internal contracture. Uh, one is uh, uh, releasing the subscapularis, and uh, the other one is uh, the anterior approach. They do completely different things because mm -hmm. releasing the subscapularis, of course, is a muscle slide. And you understand very clearly that it, it allows uh, good function. If you take out the, the, the coracoid, you don't touch the subscapularis. And it works very well also. So there is something we do not understand. Because what is the reason for internal contracture? Uh, the problem of, of, of coracoid is because of the uh, coracohumeral ligament. And if you want to to cut the coracohumeral ligament, you have to take out the coracoid. Uh, the thing is, when do you do it? <laughs> uh, first, if you have to do, in the same time, a muscle transfer, like a latissimus, I would do a uh, release, because you can do it uh, posteriorly in the same time as the, as the latissimus. If it's a late patient, if the patient is seven year, eight years old, I would do an anterior release. Advantage of the anterior release is that you get an immediate result. You don't need a cast. The patient can do physiotherapy the same day, same day, but you need to have an active external rotation. So doing, operating the coracoid means you can do it only in patients who have a, a good active external rotation. Right. The next question was, um, how would you treat uh, elbow flexion weakness in older children where they have lost the opportunity to undergoing nerve repair. Those who are presenting late yes. with elbow flexion weakness. Elbow flexion, that's what we talk. No, what, what do you mean older? What, what age? So those patients who have missed the opportunity to undergo nerve surgery to reconstruct the elbow flexion. In fact, it has nothing to do because a lot of patients who have, who have had nerve surgery have elbow contracture. So uh, it has nothing to do with nerve. No, what I mean is elbow flexion weakness. Ah, weakness. Weakness, yes. Ah, so the muscle problem, you mean? Yeah. Ah, can we improve the strength of the, of the biceps? Is that your yeah. question? Yeah. Because they, they have... Some of them, they are very high uh, trumpeting and, uh, you know, any, any no, activity. Trumpeting is not, it doesn't come from the biceps. But no, it's like when they have weak biceps, they cannot go anti-gravity biceps. So they, because they, have no external, because they have no external rotation of the shoulder. Uh, to strengthen the biceps, uh, the, the, 
the only possibility is to reinforce either the biceps or the brachialis with a nerve transfer. But you have to know if one is working or not, uh, both, you have to explore. And, uh, this is always a risk. Yeah. Now the question is if a child is having both concomitant shoulder internal rotation contracture and elbow flexion contracture, would you address uh, one by one or you would address simultaneously what you do? Depend on the age. Depend on the age. Yeah, say for instance, a seven years old with... Uh, ah, seven, yeah. I mean, old child. In an old child, uh, I, I think... Uh, I, I you know, at, at seven years old, I would not do surgery to the elbow. So I would do only uh, a cast. Shoulder. And so uh, if there is a lack of external rotation at seven years, I would do a coracoid uh, resection. And that would probably help and do after, do the, plast the, the, the casts. That probably make it easier. Yeah. And what I've seen in uh, some patients who have minimal deformity, once we correct the internal rotation contracture, the point of elbow goes posteriorly, and now they are not cosmetically concerned because their arm and elbow look straight. Earlier on, they had this posture, so they were yeah. worried about elbow flexion, you know? So yes. I also- Cosmetically, it's very important for some people. And, uh, and that's why I told you I've operated some adults because sometimes you see a lady of 25 years old who wants an operation, and uh, she's good functionally, she has no problem, but she feels cosmetically that it's a problem. Right. So let me see if there is any further question by anyone. Uh, so one question is how often deformity relapses after serial casting? So we know that if patient is non-compliant with splinting with the age, it would come back and if it is more than 30 degrees we would consider recasting yes yeah yes. so that will answer and another question is how long would you continue to do serial casting serial casting what do you mean how long so how many plasters you would uh, the, the, the maximum i've done is three yeah three and times it, three weeks and every time you see about 15 to 20 degrees correction when you go back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, really you see a very big difference because normally after one cast already, you gain maybe 15 to 20 degrees. And uh, so uh, the patient is, uh, is, is happy to continue because he can see the, the, the improvement. And the last question is, does Naraka's classification is predictive of outcome of treatment uh, in your experience? Treatment well, of elbow flexion deformity. I, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say that uh, uh, psychology of the child and the family is the most important. Right. So they have to be uh, compliant with the exactly. methodology. They have to understand, they have to accept, they have to come when they, they need to come and so on. Yeah. And the last question is, what is the, the complication which can happen with surgical or casting for elbow flexion deformity, which you would like to teach to the fellows and trainees that what you should, or what complication uh, we should have? Yes, um, I have seen once a complication which was a Volkman contracture in a cast which was too tight. Mm. Uh, yeah, and uh, at times we see a pressure shore on the posterior elbow. That is, sometimes. Why, that is why uh, you need to follow these patients. And you cannot just say, well, do the cast uh, to somebody else because it's a big responsibility. And so you must be there when they, somebody does it, if you, if you don't do it yourself. And uh, you need each time to see the, the patient, you need to, to be sure that the patient knows that he has to come back if there is pain, this kind of thing. 
And this may happen, of course, it's extremely rare, but it may happen. Great. So it was great talk. And if I summarize for all the attendees and those who are uh, attending online, the elbow flexion deformity is a real problem. Uh, and the, there are papers which suggest that if it goes beyond 30 degree, it may have functional limitation. And it is also a cosmetic concern. The treatment, uh, the, as Dr. Gilbey say, the splinting is to maintain the corrected deformity, but not to treat contractures. And serial corrective casting can be uh, done for deformities more than 30 degrees with good results. The patients who have more than 45 to 50 degrees deformity, the uh, soft tissue release can be offered Dr. Gilbe has shifted from anterior to the lateral approach so that he can approach the joint and brachialis. He has warned all of us to not to do complete release of biceps long head because that might lead to loss of elbow flexion. And whenever you do a conservative or surgical treatment, be in touch with family about any post-operative complication. At the same time, at the outset, you explain that this child would need a long-term splinting. Uh, because otherwise the deformity would come back with the age of the child. And one of the papers we found that non-compliance is a common factor for recurrence. So I think uh, that summarizes today's topic and we will meet uh, next time with some more interesting stuff. Uh, thank you all the fellows for reading papers nicely. And Dr. Gilbe, a final comment before we wind up. No, it was a pleasure to see all these young people interested in uh, bracket plexus because I think it's we have a lot of things to solve yet. And yeah. we have, there are a lot of problems we don't understand. So thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll keep you involved in our future uh, more interesting topics. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, take care. So uh, thank you attendees. And I... I in a moment, I'll stop the meeting. You have, if you have any comment, please put in chat box. Dr. Nishchal or uh, Dr. Bharat, you want to say hi to Dr. Jilbe? Okay. These all are the well, uh, plastics, the uh, hardcore fans of yours. Nice meeting you, Professor Jilbe. I met you at the Naraka's meeting in uh, Berlin. Yes. It's a real yes. pleasure to see you here. Thank you so much for your brilliant <coughs> deliberation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Nishal. Yeah, so these are all our Indian friends who are very keen on uh, this uh, brachial plexus and all national meetings we are together addressing the uh, crowds and coming out with our own questions and answers. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Am I audible? You are audible but not visible. <laughs> I started it. Oh, sorry. Stop. Yeah. Professor Jilbe, thank you very much for your uh, uh, guidance and what we need to do about all these uh, complications that we routinely see in our OPD, like uh, elbow flexion contracture and all the no surgeries that... Uh, you have been teaching us for all these years. Thank you very much for it. Okay. So, goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, Professor Goodbye, all of you. Goodbye, sir.